Excellencies, are we ready to start? Uh, first of all, let me express my gratitude to all of you and welcome you in Baku uh, once more. It's a great honor for us, uh, the matter of uh, confirmation of our very tight connections and cooperation which is lasting for a certain period of time. And we're proud that the initiative of Azerbaijan was supported by so important international organizations. We would like to use this opportunity and express gratitude to all our partners for their outstanding activity and contribution to transforming the forum into a main global platform in international dialogue. We're proud to know that the General Secretary of the United Nations, in his report, annual report, uh, underlined the importance of our forum, accepting it, like a, evaluating it like a main global platform for intercultural dialogue. And the tradition is moving on, it's living. According to this tradition, we meet every second year. And from time to time, the volume, the essence, and the variety of the topics we discuss is growing. Is growing in favor of finding the better solutions to the difficulties existing in the modern world. The last Fourth World Forum held here in Baku in the same building on May 2017 focused primarily on the topics such as the role of faith, religion, migration, human security, sports, education, arts, sustainable development, violent extremism, business in building trust and cooperation among cultures and civilizations. The forum provided a platform to discuss the way forward to build societies based on genuine respect for everyone's right, including freedom of belief, equal opportunities, and good governance, as well as inclusive framework of tolerance and respect for diversity. Among the most significant initiatives realized with the last forum, it is worth to name organization of the first high-level meeting of the international organizations Interparliamentary inter session, high level meeting countering violent extremism through girls' education, organized by UNESCO, and also our ministerial meeting. Before giving the floor to our high level guests, I would like to give you very brief information, explanation of what cultural diversity, intercultural dialogue, multiculturalism means in our country, and how we manage to create synergy in this field. As it was mentioned by the President of the country, Mr. Ilham Aliyev, His Excellency, the role of Azerbaijan in intercultural dialogue and our strategy is to build trust and understanding among cultures, nations, and communities, not only within our country, but also outside of it as well. Let's share culture for shared security. He stated once more, claiming our policy. Our geography, to a certain degree, predeterminates our roles. While investing in the dialogue of civilizations and cultures, it is not a coincidence that in recent years it has become a tradition for Azerbaijan to host prestigious international events addressing universally essential problems of inter-civilizational and interface dialogue, and we will continue our efforts on this area. We believe that despite the differences of all cultures, have contributed and can still contribute a lot to the treasure of global culture and make a significant impact on the development. No doubts that the culture could play a pivotal role in building new strong bridges between East and West, mm. South and North, and all regions of the Earth. 
Azerbaijan initiated the Baku process, as it was noted already at the opening ceremony. And we are proud to have very important contributors and partners in this field, like United Nations Alliance of Civilization, UNESCO, UNWTO, the Council of Europe, and ICESCO. We are grateful once more to our partners for cooperation and sharing this vision. Recently, the growing attention is being paid to innovative intercultural approaches in the diversity governance that reflect locally driving the dynamics. Forum 2019 will seek to reflect this by encouraging discussion and action to enhance coordination and coherence among different structures and levels within and between governments, local, national, and federal, as well as the suggesting specific approaches that can reduce policy and political tensions while at the same time leaving enough space for respect of cultural and heritage values and traditions. The main goal of the ministerial panel is to identify the preconditions for successful intercultural dialogue, to examine the society's preconditions for successful dialogue between people and communities, and the important interconnected role of religion and different groups of people on the regional, national, and local levels. In 21st century, we all are interlinked more than ever, and so should think on how to help each other to minimize threats applying best existing practices. In the, con in the context of the Universal 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development or, and the Sustainable Development Goals, we all are obliged to ensure diversity governance. We're also pleased to organize such meetings which could play an engine role in intercultural dialogue and make huge efforts for minimizing negative effects and maximizing sustainability of diversity for global development. By continuously discussing in which direction it is worth to preserve and in which to pivot, we need to foster our partnership and mobilize on concrete actions. Strengthening cooperation, implementation of the innovative intercultural approaches, discovering best ways, the role of diversity, the impact of and other significant issues are among our today's proposed topics. The forum is a platform for the governments and intergovernmental organizations to discuss how to establish a shared agenda and agreed approach for the promotion of intercultural dialogue among diverse communities and between countries. I do believe that this platform will significantly contribute to our mission, and today by sharing our vision, we are getting closer to our targets. We had representatives at this forum from more than 100 countries, and we have a very high representative of the uh, more than 30 international organizations, including United Nations institutions. So, of course, it will be quite difficult to uh, make possible for everyone to speak, but we have already proposed, approached, uh, approached uh, proposals for intervention, and I think that we have to construct our meeting with the combination of listening to the international organizations and representatives of the countries. So if you don't mind, as a self-appointed chair of this meeting, uh, I uh, will propose to make a limit for the time uh, until five, maximum six, seven minutes, but we'll try to do it no more than five, and uh, thus to give the possibility for everyone to express their valuable uh, proposals. Uh, definitely, uh, we are very highly evaluating the participant and partnership of our international organizations, and I would like to start uh, our discussion with giving the floor to His Excellency Mr. Miguel Angel Moratinos, who is in his new position of High Representative of United Nations Alliance of Civilization, honored us with his presence at this forum. The floor is yours, Mr. Maritanes.
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, my dear friend, Abul Fass. I think all of us have to, to be with me in order to congratulate you, and of course, your president, your team, but you personally for fantastic uh, organization and, and the most important, your commitment and your engagement in order to get uh, in this forum not only, uh, I would say, a good declaration, but uh, this uh, intention to get into practice and practical measure. I think this high-level meeting is uh, with ministers coming from all around the world, with international organization, and we are the ones who have made policies. So, uh, of course, uh, we have more or less uh, how is the diagnosis of the situation in the international community, but we try to focus on what can each of us contribute, what are our added value in this intercultural dialogue. So, very briefly, because I have already the opportunity to express myself in the, in the inauguration ceremony, I will try to share with you what is the role, what is the added value of the Alliance of Civilization. Most probably, some of you, or most of you, you don't know what is Alliance. Uh, you will ask yourself, what served Alliance? It's a United Nations cultural agency, is a United Nations good initiative? No, my dear friend, the United Nations Alliance of Civilization is a political instrument that the Secretary General and Secretariat of the United Nations are at the disposal in order to facilitate the prevention and mediation policy of the United Nations. So I'm going to concentrate what the Alliance can do. And I will ask you to support the Alliance in order that we all together can achieve this uh, main goal that uh, we could live in a much more respectful and harmonious uh, community. On the prevention side, the Alliance has been identified five areas where we can work together. With, of course, the Baku Forum, but also with all of you as member states. Is uh, education, is youth, is immigration, is media, is the role of women. You will say that since already other organizations take care of that. But what is the added value of the, of the Alliance of Civilization? And education, are going to replace or so try to substitute UNESCO? No. But the Alliance can work specifically in the pedagogic uh, primary, secondary textbook in order to introduce the principles and values of education based on principle of tolerance, respect, understanding, and mutual, you know, recognition of different culture and, and religions. How we are going to work with youth, the same. We have to find our niche where we can work together. The same with uh, media. And in media, we can have a certain responsibility. We have uh, the, alliance, the alliance, we have the, this uh, alert response to a certain crisis. You maybe recall, a uh, few years ago, 10 years ago, that there was this uh, cartoon crisis against Prophet Mohammed. The Alliance was alerted in order to really reestablish certain respect between the freedom of speech, at the same time the respect of religion, and the respect for the symbolic elements of each faith and religion. The same with immigration. Are going we to solve the immigration crisis? No, but we can take the integration process in a, in a way. So that mediation role is very important for the Alliance. The second element is what I call the new needs, the new exploratory capacity and potential of the Alliance of Civilization is the, what I call the social, cultural, religious mediation role. We are living, my dear friend, in a very complex society, a very complex world. Conflict, crisis, come whatever you look at, I mean, in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, in Europe, you can find crisis and conflict. And the normal attitudes that you address, you try to address them, to solve them, with the traditional way to make mediation, to try to resolve crisis. Well, this forum in Baku, my dear minister, could start to work to prepare what I call the cultural mediator people that understand the differences between culture, civilization, and religion. And they will be able 
to support and to complement any kind of mediation attitude. That is a new element, fundamental in today's world, in order that we can solve much better, in a sustainable manner, the mediation process and resolution crisis. Finally, I want to say that uh, the Alliance of Civilization have now a very urgent task. After what we have witnessed, unfortunately, in New Zealand, in Colombo, in other pl places in the United States with synagogue, now the Secretary General has asked me to draw a plan of action to protect the religious site. I send a letter to all member states of the United Nations in order that they can give the Alliance certain indication how we are going to protect what I call already a new right, a new human right, the right to pray in peace and serenity, because it's uh, unacceptable. You go every Friday or every Saturday or every Sunday to pray and you are killed. So what we are going to accept that? Are we going to accept that? So. No, boy. So that is the way I need you to work with Alliance and with the United Nations to reach this end. So we agree with the Azerbaijan government to work together in this new role of mediation and on prevention. And thank you very much, my friend Abulwes Garadiev, for your leadership and the way you have conducted all this Baku process. Thank you. Thank you very much for your high evaluation of the Baku process and readiness to cooperate in future and we are going to fulfill all our obligation in front of the OIC and uh, hope for a new very successful projects to be implemented together. Now I would like to give the floor uh, to Her Excellency Madame Gabriela Batani Dragoni uh, who is not only the Deputy Secretary General of the Council of Europe, but one of the, those who personally was involved in the creation of the Baku process and the idea of Baku Forum. We always highly evaluate it and we praise your immersion. Thank you very much. Dear Minister, thank you very much for what you just said, thank you for all your incredible work during the last 10 years, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity now, ladies and gentlemen, and excellencies, ministers around the table, to speak for a few minutes about one very concrete program of the Council of Europe that encapsulates and translates into reality of every day the situation in 135 cities. I am referring to the program of the Council of Europe, which is called Network of Intercultural Cities. So I will do that by steps, but I will not take much of your time. I would like to uh, admit, of course, that we are all aware of the underlying message of this forum theme. And this panel's topic specifically in other words, what we are trying to say is that intercultural dialogue is vital, but it is not, it is not simply an end in itself. This is important. Yeah. It must be the foundation, the foundation stone for policy, for practical measures that harness the benefit it can provide for every individual and communities. Now, at the Council of Europe, we have implemented a number of programs designed to do just that. First and foremost among these is our Intercultural Cities program. Now, over 10 years, this initiative was born out of our view that it is very important that people can have a possibility, a real possibility, to work together to forge a community of shared values in which all identities matter and all people are valued equally. This is about more than managing diversity, and thank you for mentioning this word, Chairman. It's very important, we always talk about diversity, but how do we manage this diversity? It is 
more than that from my point of view. It's about managing, but it is also about celebrating this diversity and reaping the rewards. Because the evidence suggests that there is a competitive advantage to be gained from diverse communities. What we call now in Europe a diversity dividend that pays out for all residents, not only the new ones that come into our communities, but also those who were there before. When we build trust through everyday contact with people from all backgrounds, we get that result. When we ensure that we live, learn, and work side by side, but also when we take the proactive steps required to open our institutions and public spaces to everyone. This is when equal rights, responsibilities, and opportunities stop being mere words and become lived realities. And it is where, as external studies have shown, local tensions are diffused, local services improve, and local economies, mind you, local economies, grow with the new jobs created. This is an important element, the economic one. When we speak about intercultural dialogue, we tend to forget about it. But the statistical work we have done of our 135 cities all over the world, which belong to the framework of intercultural cities, has shown that people living in that community have a GDP per year higher than people living maybe 60 kilometers away, but having a different system of management of diversity in their own city. So this is an important element, the economic one, which I wanted to mention. Now, local examples are obviously shaped by local circumstances. But the intercultural cities network nonetheless continue to grow. It started with a small number of cities exclusively in Europe and then developed year after year. And as I said before, it now includes around 135 cities spanning the five continents. Among these, the leadership of individual mayors is essential. The commitment of the local councils is essential. And the drive of individual policy coordinators have also an important role to play. So this, I think, is the most important part of my presentation. The intercultural cities, they are not born like that. They don't come up spontaneously unless you have a mayor who goes to his citizens and say, I welcome diversity. Unless you have a council who comes together and votes with budgets, proper means, in order to guarantee policies of real integration. This is the basis. If you don't have it, you can forget about it, because it will be only evenemental. It will last for a short period of time, but it will not give the results and the sustainability that we are looking for. So in these cities, of course, newcomers are welcomed. They received all the support which is needed in terms of language to start with in order to be able to communicate. Segregation is prevented. They are not ghettos. Uh, they are integration, urban integration. More than that, the local council takes agreement with the local enterprises in order to guarantee integration into work for these people who arrive. Their children go immediately to school, etc., etc. So unless you really open the spaces where you can live, as I said, study, where you can learn and you can develop, you cannot progress because then all the doors will be closed and these people will end up to be segregated and on the margin of society. Now, um, because I don't want to take too much time, I uh, simply wanted to say that we care a lot in Europe about this network of intercultural cities, and we were taken by surprise when we saw that countries like Japan, like uh, Australia, like in the United States, in Canada, but also Mexico, so many countries have acceded to this program. 
Can you imagine that Mexico has even introduced the concept of intercultural dialogue recently in their own constitution as a country? It's amazing the results that we can obtain. But in order to do that, we need to have a vision, we need to have a methodology to invest the budgets for that in the cities themselves, and that's the only way that we believe we can go in order to make this a successful story for everybody. Now, having said so, I will leave the full text because I don't want to impose Thank myself you. in order that if you make publication, all the details of what I could have presented orally are uh, present. Let me just finish with one or two points. The first one is that now, this is important from my point of view, we have established cooperation, first and foremost, with um, academies throughout Europe that do the training. Because you don't invent the intercultural policies. You need to be trained, you need to know what you have to do, what are the most important steps to start with. So we prepare a generation of people that can manage properly these intercultural policies at local level. The second thing I wanted to mention is that alongside recent work with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, we are now going to cooperate uh, with this office and uh, this is also a very good thing because refugees are, like migrants, in most of the cases, the persons uh, that go into new cities and who need to be uh, integrated. And the third positive element, this is something very, very recent, is that the Intercultural Cities Network will begin this year to use big data and artificial intelligence to assess the impact of intercultural activities. This will provide more insight than ever before on what kind of initiatives work best and under which circumstances. We need to know this in order to continue to be successful and to be able to adapt also to local situations. So having said this, I would like to uh, remind you that this morning when I make my initial statement, I uh, made the point that we do not work exclusively, obviously, on intercultural cities. We work on education, on youth, on culture. But what we do is that each city for us is a real laboratory, laboratory of experimentation with one handicap still. And this is important and will be my last point. It is beautiful when in a country you have a network of cities that share the same willingness to really develop the management of the city and of their community through principles such as the ones I have mentioned. But it is not enough because if at the national level you have policies that go in the other direction just against this willingness to develop an intercultural understanding, then there is a problem. We are witnessing it in some of our European countries where the attitude at national level in relation to migrants, refugees is hostile, not to say more than that, hostile is already enough to qualify. And if this is the case, then how can you facilitate the work of a mayor and of a local council if then there is a discrepancy and contradiction between local policies and national policies. So the next big obstacle, the next important thing that we are looking at is how to make sure that what happens in a given number of communities is in coherence and well coordinated with national policies and vice versa. That was my last point, otherwise we don't get very far. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank you for very valuable intervention and proposals. And uh, please note that all uh, your speeches and interventions, proposals are uh, noted, they are recorded, and uh, as a result of this forum, usually we have very full uh, volume of documents uh, presenting all the discussions uh, held during the, the forum itself. So now uh, I'm giving uh, the floor to uh, another person who is standing at the uh, beginning of this process. 
uh, our honorable friend, Mr. Abdulaziz Osman al tubejri Director General of ESESCO. And uh, next floor will be given to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Uruguay, Mr. Rudolfo Ninnova. Thank you very much, Excellency, Mr. Minister. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. At ESESCO, we have been working diligently with our partners uh, in the international arena, namely UNESCO, the Alliance of Civilization, uh, the Council of Europe, the Annaland, and many other uh, organizations who are, which are uh, involved in the, in the uh, dialogue uh, processes and uh, interested in creating an atmosphere for the peoples of the world to live in peace and harmony. And uh, I think SESCO in, in the early uh, days of dialogue was one of the leading organizations that uh, org organized a very important uh, conference in Berlin after the fall of, uh, of the wall. Uh, and it was, I think, our first conference of, of, of dialogue among cultures and civilizations. And it was, it was uh, opened by the Speaker of the Parliament and uh, many uh, dignitaries came and attended that uh, conference. Then came the events of 9-11, the horrible events of 9-11, and uh, immediately we organized another meeting in Frankfurt, uh, trying to uh, show to the world that uh, the criminality of those terrorists do not uh, represent religion or culture at all. It is a criminal act. But you know, the world was at that time in a very uh, tense mood, and. Uh, Many things happened afterwards. Uh, the activities of ESESCO uh, continued to, to go in the same line, uh, either individually or in cooperation with many other organizations. And we uh, started uh, our cooperation with the PACO process at the beginning, uh, in 2011, up to this moment. I think uh, we cannot work uh, in separate uh, islands. We have to master our efforts and uh, capabilities and work to, together uh, in, in a very harmonized uh, strategy to face all these uh, uh, problems that, that uh, create uh, the, 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 the uh, instability and, 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 and atrocities and uh, you, uh, all the miseries that, that the world uh, is suffering from. Uh, terrorism, as you can see now, is spreading. It, it has many different ways and different names. And there are certain powers behind terrorism sometimes, you know, for certain political or geostrategic uh, purposes. Uh, terrorism, by definition, is, is not uh, an act of, of, of a sane person or a sane nation. Terrorism is a crimin criminal act that can be only attributed to the criminals themselves who committed such horrible acts. And I think we have to define terrorism and uh, put it away from religion. Unfortunately, in the past few years, there were some tendencies to equate uh, terrorism with Islam. And this is absolutely uh, 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 an insult to Islam. Islam is a religion of peace, of justice, of uh, equality, of uh, respect of human dignity. And uh, all those who read the Quran uh, knows, know very well that the Quran is against killing uh, any innocent uh, soul. Man qatala nafsan bighayri nafs, aw fasadin fil ard, qatala nasa jamia. Anyone who kills one innocent soul, or spread corruption on earth as if he could all humanity. So how can we say that Islam is equated with, with, with terrorism or with, with any uh, violent act? Yes, there are some Muslims who are terrorists, who are uh, criminals, and this also happens in other religions and other cultures. But these acts do not uh, represent those religions or those cultures. So I would like to say that we thank the Republic of Azerbaijan very sincerely for leading the, the process of, of dialogue to, the, to, to such a, a, a wonderful uh, reality now. Now we have all the major organizations in the, in, the, in the world participating, completely indulged and believing in this process. And we have to muster our efforts and capabilities to, to make it succeed because we cannot rely all the time on the politicians. Some of the politicians have their own agendas and some countries have, have, have their own agendas. And you can see now it is a geopolitical struggle for for dominance, for, for uh, you know, widening the scope of their hegemony and, and all, all, all their interests uh, all over the world. And unfortunately, this contradicts the, the, the charter of, of the United Nations, and it also contradicts the International Declaration of Human Rights. 
what is happening in, our, in, in many parts of the world in front of our eyes. You know, many people are being killed, cities are destroyed, many people are immigrating, not willingly, but forced to immigrate, to flee their countries. Nobody likes to flee his country. Nobody likes to, to be uh, in, in, in a diaspora. But they are forced to do that. So if you want to stop the immigration, which is, I call it forced immigration, we have to help the countries normalize their situation and strong, strengthen their economy and find ways and ways for the young people to find jobs, decent life. They will not immigrate. They will stay in their own countries. And I think the responsibility lies on the major powers in the world who have the ability, the, the wealth, and the power to, to, to do so. And they can be followed by other nations. Secondly, the... Uh, Stereotypes that are, you know, super, uh, disseminated all over the world by the media, by the fanatics, by the right-wing uh, groups, parties, or uh, individuals, they instigate hatred. They instigate revenge. And we don't want that. We want to live in peace and harmony. We want to respect each other. This can be done only through education, through the media, through the cultural forums, through the religious speech also in synagogues, churches, and mosques, and temples. We cannot wait until God sends another messenger to us. There will be no messengers. So we have to be the messengers. We have to work hard to put our hands in each other's uh, you know, uh, strong faith and commitment to save our human uh, destiny, because we are all one family. If, 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 if we are in a ship, there is a, a saying by the prophet, may peace be upon him. He said, if there are people in a ship, and some of them want to uh, uh, make a hole in that ship so that they can get some water to drink. Th they will sink, all of them. Nobody will, will, will be saved. So th they have to control those who try to sink the, the, the ship. Otherwise, they will sink all of them. So this is the reality that we are living right now. And there are some cra crazy leaders, crazy fanatics, crazy terrorists who want to lead the world to catastrophes, to hatred, to animosity, to wars. I, I, I am saying this to you because I can see now I live in, in Morocco, and uh, uh, very close to Morocco, Libya is, is burning. People are being killed. In, in, uh, in uh, Algeria now, alhamdulillah, it is stable. But there was a, a try to, to disturb peace and order in, in Algeria. In Sudan, in Somalia, and in many other parts of Africa. So why we are just watching this? Why don't we come forward to stop the fire before it spreads? I think this is the responsibility of those who love peace, who love to see the world in a better shape than what it is right now. So I would like to hail greatly Azerbaijan and its leadership, and also I would like to hail my friend, the uh, uh, high representative of the Alliance of Civilization, Mr. Muratinus. He is a well-experienced person. He was one of the major instruments of creating the Alliance of Civilization. I worked with him at the beginning of the creation of the Alliance of Civilizations with Mr. Mayor and many other of our friends, and we held meetings in Madrid and in Dakar and many other places. And then the first, the first uh, forum for the alliance was held in Madrid in 2005, and I had the honor to attend it. And I attended all the other forums that were. I am very happy that Mr. Moratinos now is the head of this institution, because he has the experience, he has the know-how, and he has the spirit to make this process successful. And all other my friends in UNESCO and in the Council of Europe and all the other organizations here in the Torskoy and, and the other regional organizations. So let's work hard with patience, with perseverance, but with a great faith in our unity as one nation. All of us from all the corners of the world. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Abdulaziz Dutman uh, Altuvejri. Now the floor is going to His Excellency Mr. Rodolfo Nin Nova, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Uruguay. And next floor will be given to another foreign minister from Ghana, Mrs. Shirley Botsway. Thank you, Mr. Minister. It's a great honor to be here today in the Fifth World Forum. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I say I speak in Spanish with this translation in English. Nuestra primera. Uh, first of all, I would like to salute the Baku Forum on behalf of the Uruguayan government and, of course, thank its organizers for their efforts to make the execution of this initiative possible, something that is already becoming a tradition and is so well 
designed and carried forward. The very story of humanity who has witnessed it peacefully and trying times, as well as the others, turbulent and tragic. It's not hard to conclude after a brief review of universal history that times of peace and progress, as well as stages of good memory, have been supported by some sort of intercultural dialogue among la uh, lettre, of course, long before the expression appeared as a conceptual category in the field of international politics. Sometimes it's not easy to overcome the primary and atavistic reflex of considering the other a threatening enemy that causes insecurity and fear, and its conversion through intellectual curiosity first, and then through the construction of categories such as tolerance, respect, and a celebration of diversity progressively brings an essential enrichment and expansion of horizons, a rupture with asphyxiating an endogamy and opportunity to expand ideas, perspectives, and awareness. In short, an authentic and deeper wisdom. Peace and prosperity does establish a cause and affect a real uh, relationship, a sort of virtue cycle with intercultural dialogue. It goes without saying that for this to happen, dialogue must be uh, something more than a simple series of monologues and must be at the same time something more than a discussion. Dialogue like deliberation implies a certain openness an inclination to hear stories, reasons, awareness, willingness to learn from those who think differently based on that encounter that uh, of which offers opportunities to explore, innovate, invent, create, and experience mergers, as well as discover new directions. In contemporary and current times, these dialogues require the participation and coordination of stakeholders and the multiple agents in the governmental, uh, in the governmental, political, religious, public, private, business association, social cooperative, academic, intellectual, scientific, artistic areas, among other, uh, and among other uh, others. Uh, so it's one more time. It's just to again like to stress that that uh, the governmental, political, religious, public, and private and business association, social, cooperative, academic, intellectual, scientific, and artistic areas are quite important. The Baku Forum has become a privileged setting for the promotion of this dialogue of this nature in the today's world. It is necessary to appraise these encounters and approaches. The fact that the advances are not sudden or that they are discontinuous does not matter that they are not taken into account. They are indeed, and they keep on building based on learning, shared experiences, learned lessons, and basic agreements, which pave the way towards intercultural dialogue and strengthen their results. Among them, the most significant ones are the Pacific coexistence and cross-fertilization, as well as political and religious peace and cultural hybridization. The idea of landscape made of several systems of beliefs, ideas, and values, ways of life, cultures, civilizations, worldviews, uh, intertwining, knowing each other, guiding the coexistence and the search for a harmonious a relationship that makes the achievement of the common objectives possible is utterly encouraging. Establishing interactions between universal values and diversity is one of the essential and most delicate tasks at the same time requires a careful and sensitive engineering. Today, the prevalence acquired once more by the chapter related to migration flows when defining policies to promote a solid and equality intercultural dialogue is certainly clear. The pressing need of current migration challenges turns to the address of this central chapter of intercultural dialogue into something essential that is currently challenging the world and calls to reflection while requiring aff affirmative actions of protection and advocacy of fundament fundamental uh, human rights. In this sense, Uruguay has positive experiences throughout its history which are worth mentioning in this forum. Uruguay is a country with, with immigrant roots. 
international immigration has left a deep mark in the history of our country. Immigrants, together with the population of uh, African descent, brought as slaves and the native peoples have enriched the Uruguayan society and played a major role in the construction and the development of the country. Also, the large number of Uruguayans living abroad is considered part of the nation no matter where their residence or how long they have lived there. Uruguay has experienced an important social, economic, and human development in recent years, which has placed the country in a privileged position in the Latin American context. Our country stands out because of its democratic stability, labor security, labor relations under a secure framework for the protection of working people, access to free public education services at all levels, and coverage in universal health, among others. In this national context, and also associated to other factors, there has been an increase in immigration and the diversification of its origins over the last decade. Our migration policy is based on a positive vision of international migration for well-being and human development. While highlighting the contribution of migrants at an economic, demographic, social, cultural, and political level, both for the source as for the target societies. The integration of migrants is essential for coexistence and social cohesion. The Uruguayan law establishes among its general principles the equality of treatment and the enjoyment of rights between nationals and foreigners, non-discrimination, social uh, social cultural inter integration and respect for diversity and cultural identity. Taking Uruguay as a heterogeneous, cultural, and ethnically diverse country, migration policy recognizes the importance of promoting the value of such diversity, as well as the equal, the equal dignity of all cultures and respect for them. Likewise, it conceives culture as a key factor for sustainable development and the strengthening of the social fabric as well as the nation's wealth. Uruguay has adopted the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration at the Intergovernmental Conference on Migration held in Morocco on December 10 and 11, 2011. Our country is considered to have already acquired a great number of compact objectives. The cultural dimensions of uh, uh, the migrations and human mobility is reflected in some of its objectives. Objective 16 and 19 of the compact are empower migrants and societies to realize full inclusion and social cohesion, as well as to create conditions for migrants and uh, diasporas to fully contribute to the sustainable development in all countries. <coughs> Uruguay uh, sees human m mobility not only as a right of every person to choose the territory where to live, but also as an opportunity for the human development of the country towards the construction of a more just, diverse, inclusive society and a more equal democracy. Sharing with you our approach and experience on migration in the light of intercultural dialogue was the purpose of this intervention and the contribution we wanted to bring to Baku. In conclusion, Ur Ur Uruguay welcomes the holding of this forum and expresses its commitment to move forward in all the strategic lines defined here in order to promote the necessary intercultural dialogue. This dialogue turns into an avoidable requisite in order to achieve a non-violence world where all nations, uh, all nations could live peacefully. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for your intervention and support. We were discussing recently the uh, matter of enlarging the geography and more active participation of the different regions of the world in the Baku process. So we hope and we count on your support and your active participation. Now the floor is going to Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ghana, Mrs. Shirley Botsway, and the next uh, will be given to Mr. Abuzar Ibrahimi Turkman, Head of Organization for Culture and Islamic Relationship from Iran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Your Excellencies, colleague ministers, 
Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, allow me to begin by expressing appreciation to His Excellency President Aliyev and the people of Azerbaijan for the warm hospitality extended to my delegation and me in this beautiful city of Baku. I'd also like to use this opportunity to congratulate the government and people of Azerbaijan, as well as their partner international institutions for organizing this World Forum on Intercultural Dialogue and for placing at the forefront thereof such an important discussion that has the potential to prevent conflict and ensure that the increasingly diverse world we live in is peaceful. Remarkably, the Baku Forum and every positive discussion on intercultural dialogue that has taken place here among countries and other regional bodies remain crucial to advancing the peace and security of the world. Distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, you will all agree with me that misconceptions around culture and religion do foment conflict, ignite xenophobia, lead to abuse of fundamental human rights, and stifle socioeconomic development. An underlying principle that we could adopt for purposes of this discussion is the fact that every culture has evolved as a result of and in response to the particular environment in which it is situated. As such, no culture is superior to the other. With this basic principle in mind, our understanding of the concept of culture, cultural diversity, and their interaction, as well as management, should engender tolerance for all cultures through intercultural dialogue. Indeed, it is important to recognize and celebrate our differences in our collective effort to promote unity in diversity. Incidentally, my country, Ghana, offers a near-perfect setting for illustrating the imperative behind the theme for this year's discussion. Our 1992 constitution guarantees non-discrimination on the basis of race, place of origin, political opinion, color, religion, creed, or gender. Successive Ghanaian governments have therefore made efforts to promote tolerance, national cohesion, and non-discrimination through persistent dialogue to resolve differences and conflicting situations. Our National House of Chiefs, which is the highest body of all traditional authority in the country, is recognized under the Constitution of Ghana and plays an important role in fostering peace in the country through the promotion of tolerance and national cohesion. In this context, in spite of the existence of over 70 ethnic groups in Ghana with occasional isolated pockets of violence over the years, we still pride ourselves as an oasis of peace and security in a sub-region bedeviled by conflict. A case in point is the Dagbon conflict in the northern part of Ghana, which was resolved recently after several years of mediation involving various governments and eminent chiefs. The eminent chiefs worked tirelessly to bring peace to the area. This culminated in the investiture of a new paramount chief for the people of Dagbon early this year. I am also pleased to inform this August gathering that to strengthen its commitment to peace and security in the country, the government of Ghana established the National Peace Council by an act of parliament in 2011 to, among others, promote the understanding of the values of diversity, trust, tolerance, confidence building, dialogue and mediation in the society. Education remains one of the surest means by which transformation action towards intercultural dialogue can be mobilized. Education has the ability to transform the thinking of people and dispel hitherto immutable dynamics that divide people. Education at all levels has the potential to create understanding of our world and foster tolerance and respect for diversity. In addition, mainstreaming cultural diversity and its management into our educational system and curricula creates awareness and promotes understanding of cultural differences, thereby leading to the development of a sense of community and providing a deeper perspective of the views of others. It is gratifying to note that Ghana has always carefully infused elements of religious, civic, and cultural education into its educational curricula with the aim of facilitating the molding of the youth from an early age into responsible citizens within the context of diversity. 
Another means by which intercultural dialogue in Ghana is demonstrated is through the boarding school system, where young adults from all cultures live and learn together, thereby promoting tolerance and acceptance of diversity. This has been further enhanced by the introduction of free senior high school education by the government. This policy does not only encourage the mixing of cultures, but also provides a level platform for all children from diverse economic backgrounds to live together and to interact with one another. It is thus no surprise that the people of Ghana are recognized for their hospitality and friendliness the world over. It is also in the context of the foregoing that I seize this opportunity to acknowledge the crucial role of civil society in fostering the understanding and acceptance of our differences. Regrettably, governments very often tend to be wary of these organizations, despite their ability to reach out to individuals and groups within their communities and to highlight important issues that are easily overlooked in the broader scheme of things. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I wish at this juncture to recognize religion and its role as one of the most powerful constructs in our society and its direct link to culture. As we all know, culture is often used in support of or against religion. This automatically means that discussions on intercultural dialogue must do well to embrace interreligious or interfaith perspectives. The three prominent strands of faith in Ghana are Christianity, Islam, and traditional religions. In line with government's efforts to promote national cohesion, all three religions are allowed to be taught in schools. It is also common to find people of different faiths coexisting within the same family or community. There is, of course, a significant few who belong to other faiths besides the three major religions, as well as the non-religious, all of who coexist peacefully. Significantly, the three main religions by convention are usually allowed to offer prayers and other rituals during national events in the country, often to the admiration of visitors. Government provides subsidy to both Christian and Islamic schools and also supports compatriots who embark on Hajj pilgrimages to Mecca in Saudi Arabia by facilitating their travels. Meanwhile, the government has recently announced the construction of an interdominational Christian cathedral in the capital Accra to commemorate Ghana's 60th independence anniversary. Demonstrably, the president of the land, his vice, or their representatives have always endeavored to participate in major religious activities held in the country, be they official or private. Apart from the efforts of high-ranking officials of government, Christian and Islam leaders and groups periodically organize interfaith dialogues, especially during election years, to preach tolerance and peaceful coexistence. It is worthy to note that in the true spirit of religious tolerance, the national chief imam of Ghana, who is the recognized head of all Muslims in the country, attended mass at a Catholic church on Easter Sunday recently as part of a series of activities to commemorate his 100th birthday, birthday. In so doing, the chief imam sought to reinforce the positive message that there is a lot that unites these two Abrahamic religions than divides them. It remains our strong belief in Ghana that there can indeed be unity in diversity and that the challenges of this world can only be surmounted when we understand and appreciate our differences. Similarly, we as a country are convinced beyond any reasonable doubt that the continuous guarantee and protection of the fundamental human rights of all persons is critical to the promotion of intercultural dialogue. It remains the surest way of galvanizing momentum across the country towards transformative action and meaningful development. Accordingly, Ghana has actively contributed and continues to contribute to discussions on resolutions and decisions within the Human Rights Council, the UN General Assembly, and various UN agencies and international fora aimed at engendering peace, inclusion, intercultural dialogue, gender equality, and development. In closing, I wish to reiterate the fact that multicultural harmony can be deliberately nurtured through a multitude of means, including legislation and government policies, 
coupled with a conscious political commitment. The others are education, respect for human rights, equal opportunities for all, and regular interfaith dialogue amongst the citizenry. These are all important steps in overcoming the different cultural backgrounds, worldviews, stereotypes, and misconceptions that hold us back from open interactions and respective exchanges, whether as individuals, groups, or societies. Finally, as we seek to identify the various elements that propel intercultural dialogue and stimulate further engagements, we should not forget the power of social media and sports in the equation. These two elements wield enormous influence, especially on the youth, whose tremendous energies and creative abilities need to be optimally harnessed for a peaceful world. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. And I think that the participation of the Honorable Ministers of Foreign Affairs uh, at our Intercultural uh, Dialogue Conference is a remarkable uh, notice of the value and importance of this topic for the governments of different religions, of different regions of the world, and we are mostly welcome your participation here. Now I'm giving the floor to uh, His Excellency Mr. Abuzar Ibrahimi Turkman, who is the head of Organization for Culture and Islamic Relations from Iran. And next floor is going to, after him, going to Mr. Alexander Bagdanovich, who is the Minister of Culture from Montenegro. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Mr. Minister, if you let me, uh, I have uh, my speech in Persian language, so translators have uh, my speech in another languages. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ibtida mayelam. از دولت جمهوری آزربایجان به ویژه رئیس جمهور محترم آزربایجان جناب آقای الهام علیوف به دلیل برپایی چنین اجلاس مهمی تشکر کنم و سلام ملت و دولت جمهوری اسلامی ایران را به مردم و دولت آزربایجان ابلاغ نمایم برگزاری پنجمین مجمع جهانی گفتگوی بین فرهنگی را در جمهوری آزربایجان اقدامی نیک می دانم و از خداوند متعال برای برگزار کنندگان این برنامه توفیق آرزو می کنم. پرداختن به این نوع از برنامه ها در جهان پراشوب کنونی گامی ارزشمند در جهت استقرار صلح و امنیت و ترویج مداراست. حضار محترم، رئیس محترم و اندیشمندان گرامی در گذشته همواره اندیشمندان جهان را اندیشمندان جهان را با تکیه بر عنصر اقتصاد طبقه بندی می کردند. طبقه کارگر و کارفرما، جهان اول، دوم و سوم، کشورهای پیشرفته و کشورهای عقب افتاده و تقسیم بندی های مختلف دیگر. همه این تقسیم بندی ها بر محور اقتصاد شکل می گرفت و قدرت اقتصادی سبب اصلی این تقسیم بندی ها بود. تقسیم بندی بر اساس فرهنگ هیچگاه مورد توجه نبوده است در دهه های اخیر این نگاه قوت گرفته است که در کنار قدرت اقتصادی توجه اصلی به فرهنگ معطوف شود و بر اساس قوت و ضعف فرهنگی نیز بتوان ملت ها را به طبقات توسعه یافته و عقب افتاده تقسیم کرد اگر ملتی از نظر اقتصادی در رفاه باشد و آسایش را که مربوط به تن از تأمین کند اما در تأمین آرامش که مربوط به روح است ناکام باشد نمی تواند در این تقسیم بندی به عنوان ملت توسعه یافته و متمدن به شما راید ایران و آزربایجان از کهانترین ادوار تاریخ بشری همراه و هم فکر بودند و اقلیم فرهنگی مشترکی را با یکدیگر ساختند که هنوز هم دارایی مشترک همه مردم این اقلیم فرهنگی محسوب می شود این منطقه از گذشته کانون فرهنگ و هنر و اعتقاد و در این حال رواداری و مدارا بوده است با دریغ و درد در همین قرنی که دای آزادی و تکسر و همزیستی دارد کچفهمی های برخی از پیروان ادیان گوشه و کنار جهان را به قتلگاهی برای یکدیگر تبدیل کرده است حوادث دردناک نیوزلند و سریلانکا در همین چند روز گذشته رخ داده است در این حوادث آشکارا انتقام گیری پیروان ادیان از یکدیگر را به چشم می بینیم ولی در همین منطقه‌ای که امروز ما در حال گفتگو هستیم از مادری مسیحی و پدری مسلمان 
خاقانی زاده شده است که نمونه ارجمند انسان فرهیخته روزگار خود بوده است صد سال پیش بشر تصور می کرد که با دستیابی به فناوری های نوین سرعت پیشرفت های جوامع شتاب بیشتری می گیرد و آرامش برای بشر برمغان می آورد اما چنین نشد و امروز به جای آن که فناوری های پیشرفته به تأمین آرامش بشری کمک کند به ابزاری برای سلب امی اعتذر عن هذا الخلل التقني منذ مئة عام خلط ظن البشر وأن زخم تقدم المجتمعات يزداد تسارعا باستحواذها على التكنولوجيات الحديثة ما يجلب معه الراحة للبشر إن الأمر لم يكن كذلك وقد تحولت تلك التكنولوجيات المتطورة اليوم إلى أداة لسلب الراحة بدل تأمينها فساهمت في تعزيز القوة الاقتصادية والسياسية والعسكرية والتقليل من شأن القدرة الثقافية والقيم المعنوية والأخلاقية مواجهة فرشتاب نظام الشكل جيري رأي وعنديشي إنسانيس غرق شدن در خوشی ها و سرگرمی ها و خروب فرو غلطیدن در غفلت مجال اندیشه را از بین می برد و جایی برای بروز نیازهای معنوی و تجلی معنویت انسان باقی نمی گذارد به تعبیر دیگر چنین فردی گرچه اسارت تن ندارد اما اسارت اندیشه دارد انسان برای رفع نیاز تلاش های خود را در زمینه دستیابی به فناوری های نوین افزایش داد اما به یک بار خود را نیازمندتر از گذشته یافت به گونه ای که دامنه نیازهای خود ساخته بشر امروز بیش از هر زمان دیگری است معنویت انسان را به بینیازی تشویق می کند و فناوری مصرف گرایان این نیازهای خود باشد اما فناوری مصرف گرایانه او را اسیر نیازهای خود کرده است متاسفم که بگویم دنیای امروز به سوی اسارت اندیشه گام برداشته است این قربانی یعنی کسی که اندیشهش در اسارت است حتی نمیداند که قربانی شده است این همان غفلت است گفتگوهای فرهنگی حاصل beautiful and ugly have been misplaced and harmony of life has been undermined marwena chatur and his marwani compare the condition of ignorance and unawareness to a person who is sleeping on the sea beach and dreams that he is thirsty the distance between his thirsty man and water is only an unawareness and ignorance The sleeper searches in the vast desert, wave lashes at him recklessly. The sleeper dreams of sure thirst. Water is closer to him than his jugular vein. Negligence goes ignorance. The problem of the world today is ignorance in awareness, which is interpreted as modern and awareness. The root of modern and awareness is disbelief, <coughs> disbelief in the fundamental of reason and wisdom in other words it is the struggle between having and becoming what religion and ethic expects and of man is becoming aware becoming conscious becoming just becoming virtuous become lover of humanity but uh, the path uh, that uh, the advocates of violence have chosen today does not lead to becoming rather it leads to having power to prevent becoming uh, the advocates of violence consider themselves the owners of human lives and consider themselves uh, entitled to take the life of anybody they like uh, is not this perception modern and awareness one of the manifestation modern and awareness is self absolutism a self absolutism man would sit in place of god considering his own judgment defined he uncertain and this implementation a duty the perception of self absolutism do not leave any room for need and respect to the thoughts of others and under such circumstances peace would fly out of the perceptions of the self absolutism person for the purpose of peace is respect to the thoughts of father and giving up self absolutism the main feature of reason is knowledge of the truth and uh, the distinction of truth from falsehood at the time 
when sectarian religious conflicts have turned into the most violent and dangerous form of conflicts today. Rationalization is strongly missing, and due to this reason, beautiful is perceived as ugly and a falsehood as truth, and hence return to rationality and rationalism has become a reversible necessity. A faithful man relying on religious belief feels peaceful and safe if such a security is not gained in the light of wisdom and reason or even has not grown. Up under the shelter of wisdom and reason, it may uh, turn a human being into a being who would uh, use his violence to discharge his religious duty and will enjoy uh, see, uh, such deeds, uh, which uh, makes uh, it uh, very difficult for him to realize that his deeds uh, are criminal offenses. The holy prophet of Islam said, Good man, is uh, recognized by reason, and one who does not have reason has no religion. In order to wake up uh, the negligence, negligent ones, these, this is never any need to put forth any reason, and uh, the cause should uh, be taken into consideration in proportion to negligence. Uh, Azeli, in the, his book, the Alchemy of Happiness argues that negligence is an illness whose treatment is not uh, in the hands of the sick person, because uh, when a negligent is not aware of his own negligence, uh, how can uh, be uh, search uh, for treatment? Hence, uh, his uh, treatment uh, in, in the hands of scholars. This is why the duty of scholars and those whose words leave an influence on others is to remove ignorance from the deeds and thoughts of societies and explain his practical ways to get the our out of such situation. Honorable German, respectful scholars, the future way have more surprise up its uh, sleeves for us. May I suggest to this prestigious meeting that through futuristic studies, uh, let us dominate the policy of repel over the policy of removal and find some ways for moving towards repelling and preventing abnormal cultural event instead of thinking about their removal after they have what? و کسانی که سخنانشان در دیگر This is why the duty of the scholars and those who, uh, whose words have no influence on others is to retrieve is to fight against ignorance and uh, we should have uh, uh, moderate uh, approaches and uh, while uh, uh, fighting against uh, the uh, racism ex xenophobia and uh, it's, we should uh, put in place uh, a new approach uh, favoring uh, uh, coexistence, peace, and uh, while uh, fighting against the emergence of violence, and uh, we would like to reiterate uh, our thanks uh, to the Republic of Azerbaijan, to uh, His Excellency Mr. Abul Fez, uh, Ministry of uh, Minister of Culture of uh, Azerbaijan, while uh, uh, thanking uh, all uh, the, uh, the the organization, international organizations which are deploying efforts for making peace and security prevail. Merci. Je voudrais maintenant donner la parole à Monsieur le ministre de la Culture, 
de Monténégro, M. Bargavitch. Et pour, en ce qui concerne le prochain orateur, j'aurai tout à fait le privilège de donner la parole à son Altesse, la princesse de Jordanie. Euh, merci. Euh, honorable hôte, Monsieur Gavaïev, Excellence, Mesdames et Messieurs, j'aimerais exprimer tout le plaisir que je ressens à participer à l'un des événements mondiaux les plus significatifs qui soit dédié à, euh, au dialogue entre les cultures et qui euh, est un grand événement abrité par euh, Bakou, la capitale de l'Azerbaïdjan. Et depuis euh, des siècles, la diversité culturelle, le dialogue entre les cultures euh, sont euh, prônés en tant que thème que beaucoup d'acteurs euh, essayent de concrétiser. Nous devons également conscientiser les peuples et les sensibiliser à la nécessité de développer le dialogue entre les cultures. Le dialogue entre les cultures est une obligation, une responsabilité qui incombe à, que tous, à tous ceux qui agissent dans le domaine de la culture. Les principes inhérents au dialogue entre les cultures... And a foundation for development and societal welfare. Montenegro has always been a country relying on preservation of principles of multiculturalism and cultural diversity, and the government has been promoting those principles within its policies, working tirelessly in order to further improve cultural policy and promote concepts of intercultural dialogue and multiculturalism. With the adoption and implementation of the UNESCO Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, we confirm that the diversity of cultural expressions, including traditional cultural expressions, is seen as an important factor which enables individuals and peoples to express and share with others their ideas and values. Affirmation policy for cultural diversity strengthens the free flow of ideas and fosters continuous exchange and interactions between cultures. In fact, the obstacles which we face in the process of strengthening intercultural dialogue point to the energy we need to dedicate to further involvement of intercultural dialogue policy in different social contexts. A particular target group which needs to be recognized in the focus of strategies of strengthening intercultural dialogue is actually the youth, in itself a founding factor of strength in any society. Let me underline that in its history, Montenegro was a place in which cultural dialogue has always been preserved as a basic condition for social cohesion and political security. The main challenge of preserving cultural diversity in the Montenegrin context should be recognized in contemporary art practices, in other words, in production of content which emanates values of interculturalism and intercultural dialogue. In the space of contemporary art, a common experience is created in the process of transfer of universal values of an artwork to the audience. Keeping up with intercultural dialogue policies and development of multiculturalism as a main priority, the government of Montenegro adopted the national program of cultural development for 2016-2020, which is a base strategic document in the area of culture, and as such is based on promotion of intercultural dialogue and promotion of diversity of cultural expressions. In the following period, we shall take further steps in order to promote these important social and political principles, which will in turn help to support positive global changes brought forth by the process of strengthening intercultural dialogue. Dear colleagues, I believe that we can agree that we must work together in a dedicated manner in order to mobilize all our resources and efficiently make use of potentials of existing international programs and projects supported by UNESCO, Council of Europe, and other international organizations. Finally, allow me to express my gratitude to our host, Minister Garaev, 
for the organization of this significant meeting, which provided us with an opportunity to exchange our ideas and experiences and thus improve cooperation in the area of preserving cultural diversity and intercultural dialogue. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And thank you for obeying the <laughs> scheduled time. I hope the speakers will follow the limit of intervention. Thank you very much. And now the floor is going to Her Royal Highness, uh, Princess of Jordan, Dana Firas, who is a good friend of us and permanent supporter of the Forum in Baku. Next floor is going to Mr. Dusen Kasinov, who is Director General of Truxoi. Please, Your Royal Highness. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Your Excellencies, esteemed Minister. Chers ministres, chers invités, mesdames et messieurs, c'est avec un plaisir d'être aujourd'hui avec vous à Bakou pour participer à ce forum important. Et je voudrais donc vous dire merci, Votre Excellence, Monsieur le ministre, pour votre hospitalité et pour donc. I will speak today as a representative of civil society, mainly to highlight the importance of partnerships and innovative solutions in addressing this issue. Perhaps there is no timelier or more relevant topic today than that of building dialogue to address discrimination, inequality, and violent conflict. Throughout the world, we are witnessing an increase in populist narrative that implicitly, and often not so implicitly, sanctions hatred, prejudice, discrimination, and ultimately conflict. And from this form of violence, no society, no religion, no community is immune. The decline between, of conflict between countries since the Second World War is more than offset by conflict within countries and among non-state actors. My region, the Middle East, has seen a major conflict every single decade since the Second World War and the carnage continues with devastating effect on people and all that surrounds and nurtures them. In the aftermath of conflict, it is difficult to rebuild, but almost unimaginable under the heavy mental, emotional, and physical burden of successive wars. And there is much loss, the loss of human life, the loss of the most basic of human needs, safety, security, dignity, and well-being, the loss of safe spaces to learn, to play, to express, and to live, and the loss of human potential, creativity, and contribution, the loss of customs, oral traditions, religious beliefs, ways of life, music, dance, artistic expression, the collective memory of communities, and the loss of cultural and archaeological heritage sites, monuments, and objects. We have seen in the most painful and heart-wrenching destruction in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Palestine, and Libya, among others. And the destruction of cultural heritage is tantamount to the eradication of memory, of people's existence, of our shared past and common humanity. It frays the fabric of our communities and reinforces a worldview that pits man against man, the other, which lies at the very heart of discrimination and inequality and ultimately conflict. This is why I believe that the most effective approach to building a culture of peace and intercultural dialogue that fosters equality and justice must be based on the recognition of the pivotal role of cultural heritage. Cultural heritage is directly linked to identity. Our cultural heritage tells the story not only of our past, but the continuing evolution of human connections, of progress, and of the flow of people and ideas. Our heritage informs who we are and how we see ourselves. Often, narrow definitions of identity lie at the root of discrimination and conflict. And we must make the conscious and deliberate effort to build an inclusive and open sense of identity that embraces diversity. Our best starting point is a culture-based approach to education. We must work together to reform our global approach to education, to introduce an awareness of heritage from an early age, and instill in students civic engagement values inherited from our cultural heritage that include respect, responsibility, embracing differences, 
conflict management, gender equality, and environmental sustainability. Since 2010, my organization, the Petra National Trust, has been implementing an innovative cultural education program to address the, the gap in heritage education among public school children in Jordan. While the initial goal was to instill an awareness of cultural heritage from an early age, we have witnessed other important results. Program participants demonstrated overall improvement in educational outcomes. They were better engaged in their learning. They set ambitious goals for themselves. They demonstrated more responsible and caring behaviors in their relationships to one another and to public space, cultural and natural. And the program has succeeded in developing a new generation of young Jordanians who identify with their heritage, who are critical thinkers, who are active and engaged in their own development with a keen sense of responsibility towards their community, their history, and common human values. A culture-based approach to education also addresses the social challenges that come with poverty, unemployment, and economic marginal marginalization, which contribute di directly to inequality and violence. It is a learning experience that challenges embedded worldviews and encourages initiative innovation, and entrepreneurialism. Cultural heritage is relevant to our prosper prosperity and quality of life in very real ways. We know from research that culture creates attractive living spaces and is conducive to enticing business and investment. We know that people living in proximity to cultural heritage sites consider themselves happier. We know that globally, the culture industry is worth over $1.3 trillion and that the contribution of developing countries to that total is almost equivalent to developed countries. And we know that the cultural and creative industries are responsible for 7% of global employment and 7% of world GDP. And we know that almost 40% of international travelers are motivated by culture and heritage and that these visitors stay longer, visit twice as many places, and spend two and a half more than other visitors. Cultural heritage offers opportunities to improve livelihoods and quality of life in real and meaningful ways. According to UNESCO, intercultural dialogue entails equipping one with adequate knowledge about their cultural environment, receptive attitudes, encouraging exchange, and specific skills so as to mobilize both knowledge and attitudes when interacting with people of diverse backgrounds. We can act immediately in partnership among sectors and across geographic boundaries and with strong leadership at all levels by focusing on human dignity and inclusive identity building, by educating for respect, social cohesion, innovation and peace, and by promoting opportunities for sustainable and responsible livelihood improvement, we can build on our shared cultural heritage to promote intercultural dialogue and to build a culture of peace that addresses discrimination, inequality, and violence. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Abul Fass, Minister Abul Fass, for this opportunity, and, and thank you all for your, for your attention. Thank you very much. You honored us with your participation and support. Now uh, the floor is going to Mr. Dusen Kasinov, who is Director General of Turksoy. Uh, next uh, speaker is going uh, to be Mr. Mohammed Al Jabri, Minister of Information and Minister of the State for Youth Affairs if, of Kuwait. Please, Mr. Thank Dusen. you, Excellency. Saygidir Katamjilar, Hanum. Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, now we are attending the Baku based Intercultural Dialogue Forum, and I express my respect to you. And first, I would like to express my gratitude for the opportunity to participate in this forum to His Excellency Mr. Ilham Aliyev and the entire Azerbaijani people of. For 10 years in a row, Azerbaijan is housing this dialogue forum and provides a contribution to the global peace and security. In order to provide this contribution, Azerbaijan does not limit it 
uh, activities with his former Mali, a Turk soy supports Azerbaijan and all Turks uh, related uh, uh, attitudes and approaches. Last year, uh, uh, Turk soy marks 25th anniversary and we implemented more than 250 uh, activities uh, ranging from Argentina to Japan. We managed to over outreach the very wide geography to spread the linguistic uh, community and took soy plays a crucial role in uh, communitarian role and bridging different cultures. Most recently, one of the outcome of Turks activity is events held in some capitals, which is used, provides new opportunities for bridging people. Twin, on 25th April 2019, in the city of Osh of Kyrgyzstan, there was a meeting of uh, Turkic uh, state leaders. Uh, Sorum Baycham Bek uh, participated at the gala concert, and one of the achievements of this event was a symposium of the handicrafts held in Central Asia. Last year, in the city of Rabat, Mr. Abul Faskarayev uh, signed with Abdulaziz uh, Atodri the general plan. Our activities in Osh were the first activity in this regard for. Uh, Next three years, we are going to implement nine more activities. Uh, this favorable formula we follow is uh, replicated in all our partner countries, and we're ready to replicate this uh, activities. Dear participants, uh, this year we celebrate one uh, six hundred. Um, 50th anniversary of Madadin Nasimi birth. In this regard, uh, the Ministry of Culture of Azerbaijan and the Board of uh, Turkic Council decided to celebrate this anniversary. In February this year, um, his Excellency Minister Garayev and Azerbaijan delegated visited to Osh and the great poet of Azerbaijan and the thinker of this country, Nassimi, was explored, and this was the goal of this event. And bridging the souls, cohesion of the souls happen these ways when we are set on a platform for exchange of different views and ideas, and we're still working in this regard. I believe that everyone will share the same idea. We all definitely know that peace and security is based on intercultural dialogue and protection of the cultural heritage, and we should work hard in this area. In order not to keep these aspirations only on the paper. We need to appreciate these highly altered initiatives of Azerbaijan. And we are proud to be the part of activities of Turk Soy. I wish the very effective forum to you. I wish all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Kasinov, we highly appreciate the activity of Turksoy in favor of the uh, establishing big and very fruitful cooperation for with the entire countries and within the different nationals, nationalities and different traditions. 
and we are proud to demonstrate the unity of this organization to, within the all international units like United Nations, in UNESCO, different celebrations and uh, festivals we held together. So now the floor is going to Mr. Mohammed Al Jabri, Minister of Information uh, in the state of Kuwait. And next floor is going to uh, Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly of Pakistan, Mr. Mohammed Ghassim Khan Suri. Please, Mr. Mohammed Al Jabri, the floor is yours. Bismillah ar Rahman Rahim. Shukran al Rais. In the name of uh, Allah. Uh, uh, dear guests, uh, Excellency Minister, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, I would like uh, to uh, convey the greetings uh, of uh, Sheikh Jabir al Subah with the President of uh, uh, the Cabinet of Kuwait. And I would like to uh, say how proud and honored. I am to be among you, with, uh, among you here in Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan, which is uh, playing a significantly growing role in spreading the values of uh, peace and uh, coexistence uh, under the auspices of uh, its president and uh, people. The importance of this forum emerges from the need of the humanity as a whole uh, to dialogue uh, as a pillar of the relationships uh, between the countries and against violence and discrimination. Ladies and gentlemen, armed conflicts and natural disasters uh, have uh, led to a growing number of casualties and put at risk the livelihoods of people around the world, the responsibility of, based on our feeling of responsibility, we have landed strong support to humanitarian action in order to save lives and to alleviate pain and sufferings, which has uh, been uh, commended uh, by uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, he uh, designated uh, Kuwait uh, as uh, a center for humanitarian relief. Uh, and uh, he uh, honored uh, the Honorable uh, Prince of uh, uh, Kuwait. Uh, this uh, tribute uh, paid to the prince and uh, to the people of uh, Kuwait uh, is a recognition of uh, an entire process uh, since ancient times, uh, which will continue in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, um, not long ago, the World Bank uh, honored uh, Prince Subah Ahmed Jabir Subah, the Prince of Kuwait, in recognition of the role he is playing in uh, uh, supporting economic development at the regional level and at the international level and uh, in uh, bringing peace to the world. This uh, honor and tribute paid by the international community and uh, international institutions uh, is a translation of uh, their respect for the efforts devoted uh, by uh, His uh, Highness, the Prince of Kuwait, uh, to uh, enhance uh, sustainable development at all levels and to support uh, the countries uh, which need it all around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, this uh, forum is uh, an opportunity uh, for all of us to think about effective solutions to the challenges uh, that we face as a humanity, including uh, violent extremis extremism and rejection of others, which uh, will not be successfully faced uh, if we do not uh, join hands at the international level. 
we hope uh, that uh, your work will be crowned with success and uh, we wish Azerbaijan all the progress that it deserves. Uh, thank you very much. Shukran. Uh, thank you for your uh, intervention and high uh, participation here. Now the floor is going to uh, Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly of Pakistan, Mr. Mohammed Ghassim Khan Suri. Next uh, the speaker will be announced, Mrs. Maryam Merdache, Minister of Culture from Al Jazeera. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. First of all, Abu Faz Karyo. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, uh, dear Mr. Abu Faz Karyo. Uh, uh, it's my prof, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum and good morning. It's uh, my profound privilege Fifth Assembly of uh, the uh, World Forum on Intercultural Dialogue and in this beautiful city of Baku, Azerbaijan. This occasion holds a special significance for me as I lead my country's parliamentary delegation to Baku for the first time in my capacity as the Deputy Speaker of the 15th National Assembly of uh, Pakistan. Let me also seize this opportunity to express my heartiest, uh, heartiest gratitude to His Excellency Ilham Aliyev, President of the Republic of Azerbaijan, and his team for the successful organization of this forum as part of the Baku process on intercultural dialogue. Selection of Baku for holding such forum is very apt uh, since Azerbaijan for centuries has been uh, a place where cultures and civilizations met. The theme of the fifth forum, building dialogue into action against discrimination, inequality, and violent conflict is of immense importance. I am sure that the discussions and exchange of views during the forum will contribute to the promotion of intercultural uh, dialogue. Your, uh, uh, Sir, humanity has reached at a new juncture of where rising discrimination, growing inequalities, and prevalent violent conflicts are the pressing challenges. Evidence shows us that, that as strength grows, so does the potential for violent conflict between people within and across nations. Reaching the uh, level of human security, economic prosperity, social inclusion, environmental sustainability and resilience of the socio-ecological systems is almost impossible in the context of exclusionary governance and fragile statehood. As lawmakers and representatives of people, parliamentarians have a powerful role to play. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand before this assembly as the representative of a quintessential developing country that has uh, at its heart the welfare of its uh, people. Uh, we are keen to pursue a policy of partnership for peace, uh, security, and prosperity in our immediate neighborhood and beyond. We seek a peaceful environment to promote our development agenda both at the national level and in our region. It's a truism worth repeating. Wars never resolve political disputes. The cost of the war, both human and material, remain too great. Uh, competing interests of regional and extra-regional, I mean, and the other powers are deepening long-standing fissures and widening the fault lines, even as the tragedy of Kashmir and Palestine continue to fester. In these uncertain times, the global community appears to be in the desperate quest for leadership, a vision, and an order. Pakistan believes that a new consensus on peace, security, and development can and should be developed. A new paradigm for universal peace and prosperity is both 
desirable and achievable. The combination of our diversity is our shared inheritance in language, culture, and the rule of law, bound together by shared history and tradition, by respect for all states and peoples, by shared values and principles, and by concern for the vulnerable. One reason why peace, security, and the rule of law have been elusive is because the resources for the achievement are not always evenly, evenly uh, allocated. Military action and formal international bodies are often priority areas like investment. However, at the front of uh, at the forefront, there is uh, people's more people's people think about peace, uh, security, and the rule of law. Global action channeled through meaningful dialogue is the best way to bring about equality and peace across our nations. The mindless race of arms and economic opportunism should not come at the cost of the humanity. As we join hands today to, uh, we, uh, to find the forward to the true dialogue to counter discrimination and violent conflict. Islam is a religion of peace and any acts being performed globally defaming uh, uh, it, uh, uh, them of the religion are not past of it. It's a religion of peace, honestly, de uh, de honest development and, pa and happiness. Pakistan has sacrificed around 70 lives in the war against terror, and even as we lost uh, many soldiers, and we lost uh, three soldiers in uh, uh, yesterday. Pakistan always stands with Azerbaijan on the issue of Nagorno-Karabakh and uh, has uh, therefore never recognized Armenia for its uh, occupation. I may add uh, here that in 2012, the Senate of Pakistan Relation, Pakistan Relation Foreign Committee declared the Khojali massacre as a genocide. And in February 2017, the Foreign Relations Committee of the National Assembly of Pakistan passed a resolution calling for the withdrawal of Armenian occupied territories from uh, Karabakh. Uh, Karabakh uh, and would be considered it as uh, the uh, the territory of Azerbaijan. And so I we think that this uh, uh, challenge, uh, uh, this conflict, will be uh, resolved uh, uh, by peace and uh, uh, in peaceful way, and the stability will be. Uh, establish it in the region. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, Such a generous position for supporting of the national uh, integrity of Azerbaijan in, and the position of the truth and position of the uh, resolutions of United Nations. And thank you for your valuable intervention here. And now the floor is going to Mrs. Mariam Merdache, who is the Minister of Culture of Algeria. Next speaker will be Dr. Mio Tengui, Minister of Education of Myanmar. Madam Mariam Merdache, please, the floor is yours. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre de la Culture de l'Azerbaïdjan. Mesdames et Messieurs, j'ai le privilège, au nom du gouvernement algérien, de vous adresser mes félicitations pour avoir réussi à pérenniser cette importante manifestation qui, au fil des forums, est devenue une plateforme importante dans la quête des collectives, de nos valeurs communes et de nos aspirations partagées. Je remercie le gouvernement de l'Azerbaïdjan pour son hospitalité et pour la bonne organisation de nos travaux, ainsi que les co-organisateurs pour leur contribution à la vulgarisation des termes de référence de nos assises. La thématique du cinquième forum porte si opportunément sur le dialogue dans la prévention de l'exclusion et de la violence. C'est l'occasion de réaffirmer l'importance de nous réapproprier l'unité différentielle de l'humanité et transmettre un message de paix et de tolérance à l'ensemble des peuples de la planète. Le thème de nos travaux est en effet un choix judicieux à un moment où se développe un peu partout dans le monde un climat de ressentiment 
de stigmatisation et un environnement de crise et de violence. Monsieur le Nul ne doute que le dialogue nourrit le progrès. Nul ne doute aussi que le progrès partagé est le ciment des relations apaisées entre les États désireux de consolider la stabilité, de renforcer le partenariat et de favoriser l'entente mutuelle. La culture du dialogue a pour vocation d'ouvrir grand les portes de la tolérance et du respect mutuel. Seul rempart contre la xénophobie, le racisme et l'antisémitisme. Un antisémitisme, civilisation, dialogue, that is about uh, the universalization of uh, a value system and the sustainability of diversity. It's a choice that uh, the international community. La nécessité de the necessity to build a consensus based on respect and reciprocal commitment to have a common identity in its cultural dimension. The use of stigmatization and, and in terms of denunciation, it's between women and civilization. It cannot substitute itself to a partnership between nation in a community of destiny. The clash cannot be an alibi for policies when are at stakes peace and international security, economic and social development, fighting poverty, and fighting terrorism and fighting for democracy and promotion of human rights. Mr. Minister, ladies and gentlemen, so giving, uh, donc, uh, uh, promote uh, dialogue based on respect of the other and tolerance is a clear indication of commitment towards human rights and also a respect to human emancipation, to value democracy, the rule of law and citizenship. So far from any stigmatization or exclusion, Algeria choose to promote tolerance and reconciliation and continue to fight the ideology of reject and intolerance. This uh, discourse of violence and confrontation between culture is uh, a tool of a human uh, perversion. The reconciliation uh, is about the protection of citizens that are source of wealth and source of development. The promotion of dialogue between citizens of the same country based on this value will have uh, the reconstruction of the social um, fabric and uh, social cohesion, solidarity and tolerance will uh, uh, promote inclusive dialogue and respect of freedom at the individual and collective level. Mr. Minister, ladies and gentlemen, intolerance and extremism, the negation and the ideological position is strengthened and give more credit to the parallel evolution of the human communities, the will of, uh, to promote international citizenship and the absence of uh, a legal framework uh, against uh, people is uh, against uh, living in harmony. Uh, cultural respect, the sharing of uh, uh, knowledge and respect of uh, human rights within the alliance of civilization is to promote community spaces without constraint or stigmatization. 
a dialogue, interreligious and intercultural dialogue is the best means to dynamize national cohesion in all, in all its component and consolidate the universal approach based on respect of culture. We have to commit ourselves and to be based on shared responsibility, the peaceful coexistence and uh, in order to implement uh, development objectives uh, based uh, on civilization and tradition sharing. During this meeting, it's about to promote the program of this forum and share the experiences of each country in the field of education, of cultural affairs, and in the involvement of media in the culture of peace. The initiative of the Azerbaijan government that Algeria is sharing, so it's about social cohesion, about collective resilience, it's about the respect of human values. This is uh, the uh, shared heritage of uh, humanity and uh, rejecting uh, uh, the ideology of exclusion, of extremism and violence. Uh, this uh, 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 raised awareness among the Algerian uh, population about peace and stabilities and on a human solidarity. This experience that my country, Algeria, share with you today and it's towards these ideals we should uh, um, make our efforts. The culture of peace, the dialogue of civilization and the respect of uh, uh, people's will, will uh, will build a new order based on sharing and on equality and on the right of people to deconstruct, the, to build their future based on tolerance and on peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maintenant, je donne la parole au ministre de l'Éducation du Myanmar et par la suite, donc je donne la parole à la Roumanie. Excellence, mesdames et messieurs, on voudrait exprimer notre gratitude à le comité de l'organisation pour nous avoir à participer donc à un excellent euh, donc, forum international dans la belle ville d'Arzébidjan au Myanmar. L'éducation est également un outil très important pour le développement euh, durable, pour réduire la pauvreté et pour promouvoir la paix, la sécurité, la stabilité, la justice sociale, les droits de l'homme, l'égalité, la démocratie ainsi que la sensibilisation environnementale et la conservation. Le ministre de l'Éducation a mis en œuvre la stratégie, un plan stratégique national en matière d'éducation. Il a essayé de réaliser les objectifs du développement durable et le ministère a adopté la politique. Donc il faut laisser personne à la traîne. Il faut réduire l'abandon scolaire pour que tous les écoliers puissent avoir accès à l'éducation. Le ministère, donc, pour tous les élèves du primaire. Donc, l'éducation primaire est obligatoire pour, euh, pour percevoir, poursuivre leurs études, faire le secondaire à travers une éducation primaire gratuite et une éducation secondaire gratuite également. Là, L'une des réformes en matière d'éducation, c'est le système de base qui a été changé vers un système depuis 2016 jusqu'à 2021 et 2000, 
enfin, afin de développer le programme scolaire qui va s'achever en 2022 et en 2023. Nous avons mis l'accent sur euh, inclure les leçons qui vont encourager donc les compétences morales, physiques, ainsi que l'éducation civique, ainsi que l'imagination euh, créatrice et développer d'autres compétences dont les étudiants auront besoin au 21e siècle qui a été enraciné chez les étudiants de notre pays. En 2016, les, les professeurs de l'école primaire ont été formés pour ces nouveaux, sur ces nouveaux outils pédagogiques et ainsi que les nouveaux manuels. L'une des réalisations en matière de l'éducation de 2016 jusqu'à 2018, 1024 écoles se sont ouvertes et 10 600 donc, ont été construites et aussi des milliers d'écoles ont été mises à jour. La loi de l'éducation renforce l'inclusion, l'égalité et la qualité de l'éducation qui assure que tous les élèves, y compris les moins privilégiés et les plus marginalisés dans les zones rurales et ceux qui ne peuvent pas suivre les cours pour différentes raisons, ils peuvent suivre ces cours-là. Nous soutenons aussi les enfants des migrants notre ambassade à Thaïlande donc oblige les, les nous fournissons aux enfants des migrants les manuels scolaires et aussi nous passons un examen aux enfants de migrants pour qu'ils puissent intégrer les écoles du gouvernement aussi pour les le ministère de l'Éducation a fourni le soutien nécessaire aux étudiants musulmans. 3 603 étudiants euh, maintenant donc, euh, sont, euh, suivent euh, les cours dans ces écoles primaires. Et 37 1000 étudiants musulmans, donc fréquentent 88 écoles primaires. Il y a également 285 étudiants au niveau de l'université. And out of 295 students, 169 Muslim university students passed university distance education examination. In 2018, about 1,300 Muslim students set for the university admission examination. This year, in 2019, 2,068 Muslim students set for the matriculation examination. In order to encourage the Myanmar nationalities languages, 54 languages are taught in the respective schools in regions and states, including in the remote areas. The ministry provides us their ethnic language teaching textbooks free of charge. The ministry appointed 5,161 local nationalities as teaching assistants. The ministry continuously expands and strengthens the quality of technical and vocational education and training to meet the local needs and to achieve the socio-economic development. The ministry has been implementing a higher education reform process with a strong focus on research and innovation to meet the national, social, and economic development needs. We encourage more academic autonomy of the university in terms of the university charters. I would like to introduce 
what we are planning to introduce the action plan under the guidance of State Councillor Her Excellency Do Aung San Suu Kyi on non-traditional challenges in the high schools and universities as narcotics drugs. Those are very important also. Those are now very challenging to the students and youths and young generation. Secret, alcohol, beer, and road safety is also very important. We would like to encourage with the helmet for motorbike and road accidents. Healthy lifestyle is very important also to reduce hypertension, diabetes, and to promote hygiene and wash program. Sexual education is also very important for the unwanted pregnancy and awareness to the youths. And game is also very challenging to the youths and students. Therefore, we are now more school access and more learning to learn opportunities. And in Myanmar, the Ministry of Education, we encourage all students, learners, younger generation, that they have opportunities to do the best for the world to achieve sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Uh, now uh, I give the floor to the Deputy Minister of Culture of Romania, Mrs. Irina Kajal Martin. And after that, we'll be given the floor to Mr. Arun Gupta, who is uh, representative of the Minister of Culture of India. Please. Thank you. Your Excellency Minister Garayev, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. The sustainable development of the Romanian society requires a peaceful and inclusive cohabitation of different ethnic groups and is without a doubt one of the most important principles followed in developing further the Romanian state. Through legal and institutional framework, culture, education, and dialogue, the Romanian government fights prejudices of hate, racism, antisemitism, and other forms of intolerance, thus creating the basis for an inclusive and diverse Romanian society. It is not possible to refer to all aspects of the intellectual dialogue in a few minutes, Therefore, today, you will brief, briefly present our policy and best practice in contemporary arts as successful examples of our commitment in promoting diversity. The state established and support different minority theater institutions alongside the Romanian theaters to allowing the coexisting ethnic groups to use their language in the shows such as Hungarian and German and make their culture better known. The added value of this institution is the preservation of the minority language such as Yiddish as well as an opportunity of addressing issues specific to the respective minorities in their performances. This minority theater institution organize and participate frequently in international theater festivals, which mean that they have the continuously uh, enrich their repertoire and address a wider range of issues. They also take part in domestic theater festival in order to maintain the interethnic dialogue and involve the young people more. For such events, funding is ensured by the Minister of Culture, the Department for Interethnic Inter Relations, and by local stakeholders. Also, private theater companies representing different ethnic groups are encouraged to submit their own project to be financed by the state authorities, such in the case of the Roma theater companies and performances or multilingual street theater performance, which are constantly financed by the state. Such policies are implemented in other areas 
areas as well such as visual art camps, uh, the so far unique inter-ethnic art camps organized or financed by the Minister of Culture, which the participation of painters, photographers, and sculpture from each ethnic group from Romania. Exhibition of the works of Romania artists during international forums under the auspice of the United Nations or other ent entities. These activities are further proof of the intent of the state is continuing to invest in cultural exchanges and in the cultural networking. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, our responsibility is sharing common values implies or our activity, active contribution to our diverse and open society. It is our role as pure public cultural institution to stimulate creativity and innovation in arts as it is our task to promote interethnic dialogue and multiculturalism. You have to protect cultural identities and you have to safeguard our common cultural heritage. You must ensure mobility to arts and to the artists in order to offer them the possibility to synchronize with contemporary issues and most importantly, you have to offer them all the conditions you can to perform as this diverse stage they perform on are essential to dialogue, peace and stability. In the end, I want to conclude this magical city, Baku, and this beautiful country, Azerbaijan, becomes a perfect space for intellectual dialogue, intellectual dialogue in the context of uh, cultural cooperation. This forum helps to become a better space for peace around the world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for uh, such good words about our city. Uh, now I'm giving the floor to uh, Mr. Arun Gupta, uh, the Chief of International Department in the Cooperation of Minister of Culture of India. And next speaker will be Mr. Mrs. Aktoti Rahim, Rahim Kulova, Deputy Minister of Culture of Kazakhstan. Thank you. Mr. Gupta, please. Yeah. Thank you, Excellency and distinguished delegate. It is a great honor for me to represent my country for attending this important fifth World Forum on Intercultural Dialogue in Baku. India was one of the first countries to recognize the independence of Azerbaijan in 1991. India and Azerbaijan have friendly relations and growing bilateral cooperation based on civilization linkage cultural affinities and shared value of understanding and respect of other country. Atezga fire temple in the vicinity of Baku is a fine example of this old age cultural link between our two countries. World-renowned Azerbaijani poet Nizami Ganzivi had a profound influence on eminent Indian poets like Amir Khusro. Indian cinema continue to have large following and Azeri language cha TV channels screen Hindi films regularly, including the new Bollywood cinema as well as the old movies. India Music and Dance Group, sponsored by Indian Council for Culture Relations, regularly participate in Indian Music and Dance Festival in Azerbaijan. Yoga, which originated in India, is immensely popular in Azerbaijan and has become a part of life in Azerbaijan. Excellency, a culture exchange program was signed between India and Azerbaijan on 12th October 2018 during the fifth Intergovernmental Commission, Commission held in New Delhi to foster cultural cooperation between the two countries. Indian Council for Cultural Relations established a Hindi chair in the Azerbaijan University of Language. I am happy to say that we have growing cooperation in capacity building. Azerbaijan professional and students have been attending training courses and scholarship in India under the Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Program. We would like to further increase this cooperation. We are also keen to develop cooperation in other focus areas such as pharmaceuticals and healthcare, agriculture, 
education, capacity building, and ICT to promote and strengthen intercultural and interfaith relations. Happy to note that Azerbaijan adopted multiculturalism as its state policy. India being the world largest democracy with a secular outlook is the best example of multicultural society where people of different faiths, languages, and tradition live in peace and harmony. Excellency, India is celebrating 150th worth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi who was champion of intercultural dialogue and he always believed that all conflicts we resolve through intercultural dialogue. Conflict in this globe are inevitable, but we resolve it peacefully through dialogue. Intercultural exposition is the foundation to build a nonviolent dialogue between nation, region, community, and individuals. Cultural expression are product of intangible belonging of human beings, which are form of common human emotion. So far as our country is concerned, India, or in a broader sense, India subcontinent, is home to world's one of the oldest civilization. People of our land have always imbibed intercultural value as one of the oldest scripture. Rigved mentioned Anaha Bhadra Kratavo Yantu Vishwata, which means let novel thoughts come to me from all directions. That is why there are undercurrents of oneness through different cultural coexistence peacefully in India, and we have maintained a unique unity in diversity. This can be underlined by a quote from Mahatma Gandhi. I do not want my home to be walled in all sides and its window to be stopped. I want cultures of all land to be blown about my house as freely as possible. But I refuse to be blown off my feet by anyone. Excellency, I feel that there is a need to look at the issue of intercultural in line of basic Indian ethos of Vasudev Kutambakam. A platform should be created where values of different cultures find a winding cord of oneness to grow. In fact, interculturalism is new integration. People of different cultures become one for their shared concerns and achievement. The goal of interculturalism is best achieved when we learn to protect our own culture and respect others' cultures. On behalf of the Government of India, I thank the Government of Azerbaijan for the excellent arrangement for this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, before giving floor to Honorable Deputy Minister of Culture of Kazakhstan, Mrs. Akhtoti Rahimkulova, I would like, on behalf of us all, congratulate her with her birthday. She is celebrating her birthday today. So, God bless. The floor is yours, and after you, uh, we are going to give the floor to Mr. Agabe Smangulov, Deputy Head of Executive Committee of the Commonwealth. Dear Chair, uh, dear participants, good afternoon. Sincere gratitude to the government of Azerbaijan for their hospitality and the excellent organization of the fifth Forum on Intercultural Dialogue. I take this opportunity to convey to you the best wishes of the Minister of Culture of Sports of Republic of Kazakhstan, Aristambek Mohamedzioula. As you know, Kazakhstan, as well as Azerbaijan, is an active supported supporter of global intercultural dialogue and has reached a significant progress in this area. During the years of independence, Kazakhstan has initiated several large foreign projects that have made a significant contribution to the strengthening of mutual understanding between the world civilizations. Kazakhstan was uh, initiated the conference uh, on interaction and uh, confidence building uh, measures in Asia. The Congress of Leaders of World and uh, Traditional Religions and the International Decade for Reproachment of Cultures and the Species of UNESCO. These global initiatives have found a wide response from the international community, 
and have become an effective mechanism for the development of trust between nations. A few days ago, at the summit of One Belt, One Way in China, the first president of Kazakhstan, Nursultan Nazarbayev, voiced the idea of the three dialogues. Its essence lies in the restart of the international dialogue, both at the global, interregional, and the regional level. This proposal was supported by the participants of the summit. Within the framework of the international decade for the rapprochement of cultures, Kazakhstan opened the first in Central Asia and International Center for Rapprochement of Cultures and the auspicious of UNESCO. The center is engaged in research in the field if, uh, of intercultural dialogue. Particular attention is paid to the search for historical evidence of peaceful uh, coexistence of different cultures in the region. Kazakhstan is free from prejudice and discrimination. Here, in perfect harmony with each other, live and walk more than 100 representatives of different ethnic groups. First of May in Kazakhstan is widely celebrated as, day, uh, as the day of unity of people. This is one of the most revered festivals in the country, a symbol of Kazakhstan's model of tolerance. Therefore, Kazakhstan fully supports the goal of Baku process and is ready to assist Azerbaijan in its implementation. I believe that the forum is held in Azerbaijan not by accident. The rich past of this beautiful country created a historical context for it. Azerbaijan as Kazakhstan is at the crossroads of world trade roads and for this reason has accumulated considerable positive experience of interaction with multi-ethnic groups. The role of inter intercultural dialogue in the uh, 21st century is hard to overestimate. The importance of dialogue is defined by long-term trends in globalization, which make our world increasing, increasingly interdependent and uh, fragile. However, there is growing need for improving this, uh, the cross-cultural communications. This, in turn, requires the study of the traditions, history, and the mentality of the people around us and the country. In addition to knowledge, we need to cultivate qualities such as tolerance and openness in society. Creating a stable world is the only way possible to achieve the sustainable development goals of UN. Dear guests, in conclusion, I'd like to thank the organizers for their warm welcome and uh, hospitality. I hope that this event will provide us an opportunity to listen to one another, celebrate our differences, and build a dialogue for lasting peace. Thank you for your attention. Nazarlarınızga rahmet. Thank you very much. Uh, now the floor is going to Mr. Agabe Ismagulov, Deputy Head of Executive Committee of Commonwealth of Independent States. And the next speaker is going to be Mr. Idris Jazairi, who is the Executive Director of Geneva Center for Human Rights Advancement and Global Dialogue. Mr. Agabe Ismagulov, the floor is yours. Thank you, Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, let me speak on behalf of the Executive Committee of the Commonwealth of Independent States and to welcome all the participants and organizers of the forum. This forum is devoted to one of the most topical issues of the modern world. And also let me express my sincerest gratitude to the President of the Azerbaijan Republic. 
Republic of Azerbaijan for this important event. And also let me thank the, you, the Minister, for your hospitality and for giving us time to meet. The distinguished feature of the Commonwealth of Independent States is that it is in between the East and the West, the Christianity and the Muslim world. It combines all the cultures. Relations between the CIS countries are based on unique experience of coexistence and cooperation. Codependence of our economies and uh, in links between our cultures. So intercultural dialogue has a special place in our work. And we work and live very closely. We preserve our common humanitarian sphere and provide positive environment for sustainable development. There are many projects that foster tolerance and multiculturalism on national and regional issues. Respect for culture, languages, cultures and traditions of other peoples. In, for the past 27 years, the CIS came a long way from separate projects to a comprehensive framework approach to our actions. Since 2011, we have been implementing an interstate program called Cultural Capitals of the CIS. This work is based on humanitarian principles of respect to traditional cultures of all the countries participants to the CIS, special attention to the historic heritage and cultural heritage. We have a program to 2019, and the legendary city of Brest is the capital of this program. It's Belarus city. This city was heroic, and uh, it uh, st stopped uh, German troops in 1941. It resisted them heroically. We also have a forum of uh, scientists and academics and uh, workers of educational sphere of the Commonwealth countries. So we see humanitarian cooperation, in, and it also requires international intercultural dialogue and recognition of diversity, diversity as a universal value. It is very important for us uh, to include the young people in intercultural dialogue. We search for the most efficient ways to organize this intercultural dialogue. For example, this fall, Azerbaijan uh, will uh, welcome the finalists of a youth project, 100 Ideas for Commonwealth of Independent States. And uh, the Council for the Youth Issues uh, will hold uh, an event uh, showcasing the results of this project, the best practices identified within this project. At the level of uh, national leaders of the CIS, we decided to organize the CIS games that include the most popular sports activities, both Olympic and non-Olympic. And the first games are going to be held in 2020 in Kazan. Overall, within the framework of the Commonwealth, we have basic conditions for humanitarian cooperation, constructive cooperation for our young, for the youth. And we also constantly search for new formats of interaction, which is a vital part of the dialogue. In conclusion, I'd like to illustrate, to provide an abstract illustration for our forum. I give an example. For a geometric form to fall, you need to push it with a certain force. But this figure is going to resist this for the force of the push. And, and the fortitude of this figure may be strengthened by the its weight, but this is, its stability may, may be improved by its weight. So uh, to push a heavier figure, you need to push harder. So action and reaction. 
And uh, if there is a counteraction, it's going to be even more destructive. So if we take a sphere, for example, which uh, rolls without uh, counteraction, but it can reach a wall and uh, then stop. Or, or you can push it off, uh, off a certain surface and it will fall. But, but for example, stability of a cloud, uh, it's a very different stability. It welcomes the, the force and it contradicts it not violently. For example, uh, two clouds collide, when they merge and create a new form, which is richer than two separate ones. And you need to be a cloud. You need to understand your opponent to include it within you. And you yourself need to merge with it and uh, to improve the stability of both. And uh, such a world when everyone can merge with anyone else, each person ho can carry the culture. Each person requires their cultural identity. Each person needs to know their history, their culture, to remain themselves. Undoubtedly, the inner world of each person is very complex, very unique, and it is formed uh, depending on the cultural framework of where this person grew up. And each person acts and thinks according to certain paradigms. And some people depend on it more than others. And uh, the long history can affect that. And Brest, the city that I mentioned already, it shows how different cultures, when they merge together, how they create a beautiful, multifaceted, multicolored figure, a new person, a new society that reaches a high level of tolerance, multiculturalism, and humanism. It is obvious today that not just tolerance, that tolerance is not enough. You need multiculturalism. A multicultural person is multifaceted. He or she can absorb other cultures. And this multiculturalism that we discussed here at this forum and uh, that was mentioned persistently the His Excellency the President. Such bright personalities create the world. And they all have the common goal. They reach new heights by preserving the peaceful blue sky and that will warm all of us around this planet. And this is the symbol of the CIS in of our flag. And in conclusion, once again, allow me to thank Azerbaijan and people of Azerbaijan for organizing such an important forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now the floor is going to Mr. Idris Jazairi, who is executive director of Geneva Center for Human Rights uh, Advancement and Global Dialogue. Uh, and uh, the next speaker will be uh, Mr. Uh, sorry, uh, Hassan Nur Hassan, Deputy Minister of Sports, Culture and Heritage from Kenya. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Distinguished ministers at this late stage, let me assure you that my speech will be shorter than four minutes. Excellencies, regions of the world from time to time go through cycles of convergence, which are propitious for peace, and through cycles of divergence, which beget international tension and violence. We seem to be entering in one of the latter cycles. The challenge for enlightened decision makers worldwide is to reverse this woeful trend. This is a time to harness the collective energy of religions, creeds, and value systems in the pursuit of equal citizenship rights, which is the antidote to a poisoning of minds and hearts. There's been a rise of violence in the global south, which has dislocated societies. 
chaos and violent criminality have ensued, whose prime victims are civilians of all denominations. In the global north, the remoteness of elites from the daily concerns of the population and the backlash of globalization have where the disadvantaged have come to realize that they've been left behind by the happy few. And this has stimulated the rise of populism, the long-term stability of diverse and multicultural societies is at risk. Faiths are being misused to justify crime or hatred when their true interpretation revolve around worship of the creator and love towards his creatures. The terrorist attacks in Christchurch, New Zealand, or in Colombo, Sri Lanka, or in the United States recently, are telling examples of this ominous trend. Driven by the need to address the steep rise in xenophobia, racism, and religious intolerance, the Geneva Center for Human Rights Advancement and Global Dialogue organized in June last year a world conference entitled Religions, Creeds, and Value Systems, joining forces to enhance equal citizenship rights. The latter was held at the United Nations in Geneva under the patronage of His Royal Highness Prince El Hassan Ben Talal of Jordan and with a strong message of support from the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Antonio Gutierrez. As an outcome of the World Conference, a 10-point declaration entitled, and I quote, moving towards greater spiritual convergence worldwide in support of equal citizenship rights, unquote, was endorsed by more than 50 decision makers worldwide. The declaration gives concrete expression to the ideal of restoring the aspiration for a world living in peace and harmony. It commits decision makers in particular to three points. Firstly, to unite in a common endeavor for the preservation of dignity, which is a right inherent in our own humanity and for respect of the principle of non-discrimination and of equality. Secondly, to contribute to the realization of civic, political, social, cultural, and economic rights for all. And thirdly, to engage in vigorous and sustained effort for the effective of achievement and enjoyment of equal citizenship rights. This will make the regrouping of citizens into defensive denomina denominational sub-identities unnecessary. The implementation of the ambitious ideas expressed in our outcome declaration were likewise endorsed in the joint document on human fraternity for world peace and living together. The latter, as you know, was signed on the 4th of February 2019 by His Holiness Pope Francis and by the great Imam of Al Azhar, His Eminence Sheikh Ahmed Al Tayyib, during Pope Francis's historical visit to the United Arab Emirates. The joint document expresses almost identically the fundamental values and messages of the outcome declaration and underlines the crucial 
need to promote models of equal citizenship and to reject the discriminatory use of the term minorities. At the 14th International Conference on New Concept of Human Security, held on the 26th of October 2018 in Belgrade by the European Center for Peace and Development, UN University for Peace, a resolution was likewise adopted unanimously endorsing the outcome declaration of the 25th of June World Conference. In light of this growing consensus on the need to harness the collective energy of faith in the pursuit of equal citizenship rights, I appeal to the distinguished ministers present at the high-level ministerial panel to endorse the outcome declaration and to translate its principles into national policies fostering peaceful, just, and inclusive societies. It is high time that we all join hands to initiate a concrete global effort to make sure that our equally shared humanity is reflected in equal citizenship rights for all. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for your proposal. We will definitely reconsider it and keep in touch for going further with these activities. Now I'm giving the floor to Honorable Deputy Minister of Sports, Culture and Heritage from Kenya, Hassan Nur Hassan. And the next speaker uh, will be Mr. Sadiq Sheikh Niaz, who is chairman of Turkpa. Uh, and after that, we have only one uh, another intervention. So be patient. We have only three speakers, and we will be in time. So, Mr. Hassan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, may I join the other colleagues uh, in thanking you and your government sincerely for hosting our delegation since our arrival yesterday in the best of ways that we've ever seen. Your Excellencies, Honorable Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to join you at this important forum to discuss intercultural dialogue uh, in relation to human security, peace, and sustainable development. As you are aware, a country that does not embrace intercultural dialogue is prone to misunderstanding, inequalities, social and political instability, among other vices. This initiative, therefore, provides a platform for leaders to come together and focus on intercultural dialogue and cultural diversity as a major step towards achieving peace, human security, and sustainable societies. Kenya is one of the state parties that have ratified the several UNESCO conventions that promote peace, global and intercultural dialogue, and cultural diversity. These conventions, especially the 2005 one, have been used to identify and promote critical elements that foster the appreciation of diversity among various peoples of Kenya. Indeed, I am glad to note that it is through common values and our cultural diversity that we are able to get an inclusive society that will foster intercultural dialogue. Reflecting back home in Kenya, the initiative taken by the government to promote intercultural dialogue include the promotion and development of tourism infrastructure. As you may be aware, Kenya is one of the best African countries with world-class tourism products, such as key archaeological and paleontological finds associated to the cradle of mankind and the wild beast migration, good, good climate conditions, and world-class hotels, which attract many tourists from all over the world. Indeed, Mr. Chairman and delegates, don't die before you visit Kenya. Kenya also hosts one of the, great, the largest refugee camps in the world under the UN program, program for refugees. This has risen to due, arisen due to instability in the neighboring countries of Somalia, Sudan, which was the focal point in ensuring that there is return to normalcy, peace and stability in both countries through dialogue and diplomacy. Due to the divisive nature of our politics, ethnicity takes center stage during every election cycle in the African continent. However, the government has put in place several initiatives, which includes involvement of the media and the civil society 
in educating the masses to embrace an inclusive society and a formulation of structures to deal with national cohesion and integration at both national and county levels. Initiated school programs that are inclusive and participatory to embrace national values and propagate them to other members of the society through visual arts, performing arts, music and dance, especially songs that promote peace and reconciliation. Music and dance being a universal language has the potential to convey messages of peace and unity across different backgrounds in cultures, among cultures and beliefs. Dear delegates, the government of Kenya also supports the documentation of indigenous conflict resolution mechanisms through the application of some traditional initiatives in managing conflicts and promoting peace in Kenya. This goes in line with the African traditional philosophy of Utu, which means peace, love, and preaching unity over individual or ethnic-based interest. In addition, Kenya supports the youth population by providing a platform to nurture and develop skills through intercultural exchange visits and programs aimed at promoting dialogue and understanding among different cultures. Moreover, due to the uncertainty in their identity formation, the youth have been an easy target for radicalization, terrorism, and extremism. The government has put measures to engage its youth in positive and creative industries through sports and arts. The government of Kenya has also strong interlinkages and networks that play an important role in promoting peace and intercultural dialogue. Key among them is the community peace museums, cultural centers, civil society and private companies and corporations. A good example, Mr. Chairman, is through the m -Pesa mobile platform where money is sent to several destinations using the mobile network. This is a Kenyan invention that has earned international awards for ease of doing business in the world. On the international scene, cultural cooperation plays an important role. These initiatives are firmly founded on government programs which work within the framework of bilateral and multilateral engagements that support cultural dialogue between Kenya and other countries. A good example is our cultural agreement with the Islamic Republic of Iran, which has exchanged artists, music, musicians, sculptors, filmmakers, with a view to promoting culture of peace and interreligious tolerance and understanding amongst our people. Kenya has also supported cultural activities such as festivals, which are now emerging as an important fora to initiate dialogue between opposing groups, rebuilding trust and empathy in communities devastated by conflicts. The Electrokana Festival is a good example of such initiative. The festival plays a great role in reconnecting pastoralist communities with their identities and foster appreciation of cultural diversity, paving the way towards mutual understanding. It also helps the communities to, re to regain a sense of normalcy, enjoying art, and beginning to heal the scars inflicted as a result of long histories of conflict and in inter-ethnic violence. Further afield, Kenya is known for its prowess in sports and other fields. Mr. So Chairman, just this week, we won both the, the, the Women and Men's Marathon in London. The country's participation in sports opened up a worldview that recognizes the role of sports in promoting cultural dialogue and peace. Likewise, the local sporting programs have been an, an avenue for bringing communities together. Ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, I wish to reflect upon the resolutions this meeting made during the third forum held from 18th to 19th of May 2015, at which culture was identified as a driver and enabler for sustainable development, and the request for its inclusion in the Sustainable Development Goals. I want us to revisit this agenda during this meeting with the hope that it will encourage people, organizations, and countries around the world to take necessary steps and formulate action plans towards achieving this goal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for listening to me. Thank you very much, and congratulations on winning this marathon in London. Uh, now the floor is going to Mr. Sadiq Sheikh Niyaz, Chairman of Turkpa, and the next speaker will be Mr. Fatwan Fazlui, who is representing the Minister of Culture of North Macedonia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, first of all, I would like to extend my gratitude to our host, Azerbaijan, his authorities as well as our organizers and international partners for the organization of this August Forum and giving an opportunity to address such an honorable audience. I am very pleased to visit in the brotherly land of Azerbaijan. Turkic-speaking countries attach primary importance to the promotion 
of intercultural and interreligious dialogue at all levels. Multiculturalism, uh, multiculturalism and uh, tolerance is a long-standing tradition in the Turkic world that strengths and consolidates the society. Thus, for ages, people of different nationalities and religions have been living in peace and dignity. Turkic cooperation platform, primarily based on practical, sincere, and result-oriented action that demonstrated the political will of our country that regards strengthening peace and security of international community. Besides, it is worthy to note that Turkic-speaking countries can serve as model of intercultural and interface understanding. Their people with different religious and ethnic backgrounds live together in peace and harmony. Historically and naturally, Turks are the people that reject cultural or religious seclusion. Turkic peoples and communities stretch between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans practice various religions, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Judaism, Tengrian beliefs, and at the same time, they have rich racial and cultural appearance and features. Today, when the world is challenged by various threats aimed at undermining peace and tolerance, we must promote and advance the Pacific ideas through cultural and social action, and this action should be collective. Esteemed participants, I once again would like to thank the host for their excellent arrangements and cordial hospitality. Wish you all the best for the discussions ahead and looking forward to meeting you on the future occasions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now the floor is going to Mr. Fatum Fazlui, Chief of Cabinet of Minister of Culture of North Macedonia, and the last speaker is going to be Ambassador Salim Yunel, who is representing the organization of the Black Sea Economic Cooperation. Uh, Mr. Fazlui, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your Excellencies, dear ministers, distinguished guests, allow me at the beginning, on behalf of the Ministry of Culture of the Republic of North Macedonia, Mr. Asaf Ademi, to greet this eminent gathering and to extend my sincere congratulations and gratitude for the excellent organization and warm hospi hospitality to the host of this important conference. Undoubtedly, this event is a great opportunity to jointly consider not only the economic, financial, and material, but also all other sp spiritual, social, religious, and cultural issues that are burdening the world today. The world has for a long time been facing a crisis that reflects the spiritual and cultural state of hum humanity, of the fundamental values of contemporary civilization. In that sense, all of us belonging to the various religious, cultural, ethnic, political entities must contribute with something that cries to prevail, at least in a spirit spiritual way, through dialogue and understanding, in, in order to lead to an harmonic direction of action. I have the impression that the answer of this conference is favorable and positive. Let's do something all together in that direction. Dear guests, Republic of North Macedonia and internally in its order and de de development, as a typical multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multi-religious society, does everything to find solutions through dialogue for favorable relation between all our communities. These solutions are implemented even in the provinces of our uh, constitution, even in the legal order. The government of the Republic of North Macedonia invests a lot in respecting and promoting the culture of all the communities that live in our country. Our country survives precisely on the basis of respect of the fundamental values of its citizens, regardless ethnic or spiritual determination, cultural or religious affiliation. The so-called model of multiculturalism, for example, integration into society without assimilation or predominance 
of integration based on social diversity in our imperative. In that direction, I'll be very pleased to mention that in the Republic of North Macedonia, a series of activities are being implemented that promote intercultural dialogue, among which is the World Conference, Conference on Interreligious and Intercivilization Dialogue, which will be held this year for the fifth time. This international event that has expansional benefits in the context of building our mutual dialogue from year to year is more loudly promoting the thesis that culture and religion are the most monolithic factors of peace, coexistence, prosperity, and well-being. I would like to emphasize that as a host of this conference, we are very pleased that more than 500 missionaries, representatives of all religions from over 30 countries in the world, from several continents, from many international organizations, experts, professors, have so far accepted the initiative for this gathering. These are true sacred and religious uh, leaders, cultural and scientific authorities, researchers and thinkers from the spiritual, social, and cultural fields. Allow me on this occasion to notice that the continuation of the World Conference on Interreligious and Intercivilization Dialogue has spurred other re regional and world meetings on the subject of dialogue between religions, different cultures, and civilization at, at the level of governments, religious leaders, and artists. And as a chain reaction in a positive sense, we understood more about the problem and wishes for our neighbors so that we can better understand them. In that sense, I appreciate that this type of activities and concrete actions must continue. We must promote the valuable artifacts from these platforms in front of the domestic and the international community. community. We have to transform the conclusions of these conferences into specific development strategies that have benefit for all of us. With our participation, through experience, communication, good intentions, and useful suggestions, we must carry out concrete actions to contribute and give part in the construction of a model of a civilization of peace, tolerance, understanding, and coexistence. Respected members of this forum, I firmly believe that the opportunities created and established at this conference will trace many paths to success. I will wish, finish with the words of, of Mahatma Gandhi who said, the difference between what we do and what we can do is sufficient to solve all the problems in the world. Let's all jointly contribute to bridging that gap, the gap between what we do and what we can do. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much. Now the, the last floor is given to Mr. Salim Yunel, Ambassador uh, representing Organization of the Black Sea Economic Cooperation. Please, Ambassador. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you for giving me the floor. I do represent the Black Sea Economic Cooperation, a regional organization of which Azerbaijan is a founder member. We are a diverse group. Diversity is our middle name and it's our strong point. Uh, this morning we listened to the high speakers, high representatives, and the 22 speakers before me. So they have expressed the main elements, the issues. I don't have to repeat them. Diversity used to be considered enrichment. Now it's considered to be a challenge, uh, a major problem. And we have to ask ourselves, why are we in this situation? Throughout history, there have been hate. We know that. This is nothing new. But why is hate and, and these kinds of violence spreading so much throughout the world? If we're going to meet this challenge, if we're going to find a remedy, we have to ask why this is happening. There's a lot of reasons. Lately, it's migration, maybe, economic reasons. But I think that we have seen that people have always been local. And uh, even though we are connected globally, we are still very local. We live in bubbles, small and large, and have difficulty in accepting changes. Here, even in this room, we are in a certain bubble. The current main element that disturbs the dynamics of diversity is how technology manipulates our understanding of events and information. This points out to the security element. 
economic security as well as physical security. Changes are part of the unknown. The unknown causes fear and suspicion. If you come from a foreign culture and interact, interact with another culture, and this is compounded by false information, then we may react in an unfortunate manner. Confusion is the main staple of the extremists, the racists. We are easily, unfortunately, manipulated if we accept information at face value without giving it a second thought. We are living in a fast-paced world in which our, we base our information on sound bites. This is dangerous. We need to use our common sense and filter them out. But how are we going to overcome this situation? Firstly, we've heard it this, this morning as well, it all depends on dialogue, yes. But there's also a need for inquisitiveness, trying to understand the other, empathy. Do we have time to understand? Do we have time to listen to the other? We need to reach out to as many people as possible. But we also need to provide correct information, not alternative facts or post-truth. And we need to have a two-pronged approach, not only bottom-up, but also top-down. And this, of course, we have to ask our leaders. They have to lead rather than be led by these forces. Their statements are crucial in passing down soft messages. We've talked about SDGs. Well, I think that we have to add a few things. We have to make tolerance sustainable. We have to make understanding sustainable. We have to make compassion sustainable if we are to make democracy sustainable. We take democracy for granted, but it is fickle and needs to be protected. Protected from populist tendencies and politicians. That is how we can start to overcome the challenges to diversity. Thank you once again for giving me the floor as the last speaker, Your Excellency. Thank you very much.